Welcome to Essential English. Your journey to English mastery starts here. Whether you're a beginner or looking to level up your language skills, we've got you covered. Our channel is packed with engaging content that will make learning English a breeze. From grammar tips to vocabulary boosters, we've got it all. So grab your pens and get ready to dive into a world of words. Explore the pages of our virtual library where books come to life and knowledge awaits. Let our animated globes take you on a linguistic adventure around the world, discovering new cultures and expanding your horizons. Join our community of language enthusiasts and embark on a journey that will transform your English skills. So what are you waiting for? Hit that subscribe button and let's start this exciting journey together. Essential English, your passport to fluency. Let's get started. Lesson 12. Great Britain's 2. Oliver Cromwell Mr. Priestley One of the chief threads that make up the pattern of English history, a thread that runs through it from the earliest times almost to our present day, is the struggle between the king and the people, or the parliament, to decide which should be supreme. At first and for many centuries, the king was all-powerful. But gradually his powers were reduced and those of parliament built up until now it is the parliament that, in all, but name, is the chief power in the land. And in this long struggle one of the most decisive moments came. In the 17th century. It was during this period that the political parties as we know them today began to take shape. Charles I was on the throne. His portrait, painted by Van Dyck, has given us a vivid impression of his handsome face with its sad, thoughtful eyes, his kingly manner, and his charm. We know that as a man he was admirable, sincerely religious, a faithful husband and a loving father. As a king, he was dishonorable, and untrustworthy. He was brought up to believe in the divine right of kings, and hated the idea of a parliament, believing that its only purpose was to vote the money that he thought necessary. To get the money he lightly gave any promise that Parliament asked for, and just as lightly broke that word of honor. Time and again, he was trusted, and time and again, he was false to that trust. Until it was forced on the people that no promise that he gave was of any value. At last, when Charles entered the House of Commons itself with the intention of arresting, the five men who were the leaders of the party that opposed him, people realized that if freedom and truth and justice were to live at all there was no other choice but to resist him by force. The actual fighting in the Civil War broke out in 1642. At first the tide of battle went completely against the parliamentary forces, and they were hopelessly defeated in almost every battle. It was natural that they should be. The majority of the country landowners and the wealthy men, most of whom had been trained in arms and had weapons and horses, supported Charles. He had, too, skillful leaders like Prince Rupert of the Rhine, he had all the gay, pleasure-loving, fashionable gentlemen of England, the cavaliers as they were called, on his side. The royalists were far more attractive than the parliamentarians. They had learning, courtesy, and good manners. They loved poetry and music and art, their long, curled hair and gay-colored clothes were the outward expression of an inward gaiety and love of the beautiful. The parliamentarians had none of this charm. They were mostly Puritans, men who wanted a simpler and plainer form of religion, and in the picture Cavalier family. Among the extremists at least, only too often, this showed itself in an actual dislike of the beautiful, merely because it was beautiful. It led them to destroy pictures, the lovely stained glass windows of churches, and often the churches themselves. The Puritans, too, bore the outward signs of their beliefs, their dress was plain and dull. In coloring, their hair was cut close, the cavaliers called them roundheads, their faces were habitually sour. To them all pleasures, even the most innocent, were sinful things. They scorned learning and art, they were bitterly intolerant of the opinions of their enemies and the pleasures of their friends. But, on the other side of the picture, they had a courage that no defeats could crush, they had a religious faith that inspired every act of their lives. For them God was a living, daily reality. If they knew nothing of the works of philosophers and poets they were deeply read in the writings of God, 
is their names were not found in the book of courtiers, they were written in the book of life. Their places were houses not made with hands, their crowns were of glory that should never fade away. On the rich and the learned, on nobles and priests, they looked down with scorn, for they knew themselves to be rich in a more precious treasure, nobles, by a greater right, priests by the laying on of a mightier hand. Thus, the Puritan was made up of two different men, the one all humbleness, gratitude, feeling, the other proud, calm, unbending. He humbled himself in the dust before his maker, but he set his foot on the neck of his king. The Intensity Of their feelings on one subject made them calm on all others. They had their smiles and their tears, but not for the things of this world. For them death had lost its terrors and pleasure its charm. 1. Macaulay, 1800-59, Essie on Milton. But courage and religious faith alone are not enough to win battles. Leadership and training are necessary too, and it was the hour, the darkest hour for the parliamentary forces, that brought the man, Oliver Cromwell. Cromwell was a country gentleman. A farmer of Huntingdonshire, with no desire to be known in the world. He had wanted to leave England and find a new home in America where he would be free to worship as he wished, but the king had forbidden him to leave England. He had been in Parliament, a rough, ungraceful figure, unskillful as a speaker, but known for his strength of character and his deep sincerity and religious feeling. Cromwell saw that if the Parliament army was to be victorious it must not only be as fearless and as full of faith in its own cause as the cavaliers were in theirs, but it must be as well trained as Charles's army, and, if possible, better trained. He went to the eastern counties and gathered soldiers there, men specially picked for their courage, strength, horsemanship and religious feeling. He said, a few honest men are better than numbers. If you choose good, honest men to be captains of horse, honest men will follow them. He trained his men in complete obedience, filled them with the desire to fight for freedom, parliament and religion, combining the spiritual and the practical as in his famous order, trust in God, and keep your powder dry. Then when they were ready, he led them into battle, and on that day his army, the Ironsides as they came to be known, did not give way. For the first time the cavaliers had been held. Several battles were won by the parliamentarians, and finally at Naseby, 1645, the king's forces were completely defeated. Cromwell was now leader of the whole parliamentary forces, the king's army was scattered and the king himself was in flight. Seeing that his cause was lost, he gave himself up and was imprisoned in Carisburg Castle in the Isle of Wight. Finally, he was brought to trial in London for having made war on his people and for being an enemy of his country. He was found guilty and sentenced to death. At his trial, he behaved nobly and firmly, refusing to defend himself before a court which, he said, had no power to try him, and he himself received the death sentence with a calm courage. Four days later, after a sad farewell to his younger children one in St. James's Palace, he walked across St. James's Park through the snow to Whitehall. And there, outside the palace, he was beheaded. Whatever may have been his faults in life, he bore himself like a real king in his last moments. He nothing common did or mean. Upon that memorable scene. But bowed his comely two head. Down as upon a bed. 1. His wife and eldest son had already gone to France. 2. Comely, Kemly, equals handsome, poetic. From a poem by Andrew Marvel, 1621-78. Cromwell now became ruler of England, not as king, but as protector of the Commonwealth, and for ten years he ruled England firmly but well. He could be merciless, his treatment of Ireland is one of the blots on his character, yet he loved mercy, and in an age that was bitter with religious intolerance, he was nobly tolerant. The state, in choosing men to serve it, Cromwell wrote before the Battle of Marston Moor, takes no notice of their opinions. If they are willing, faithfully to serve it, that is enough. And from the field of Naseby, just after the victory, he wrote to the Speaker of the House of Commons, Honest men served you faithfully in this action. Sir, they are trustworthy. I beg you in the name of God not to discourage them. He that risks his life for the liberty of his country, should have liberty of his conscience. 
In things of the mind, we look for no compulsion, but that of light and reason. It was he who really united England, Scotland, and Ireland, who enforced justice and order at home and made England stronger and more respected abroad than she had ever been before in the whole of her history, and if he at times acted like a tyrant, he did it because in this, as in the execution of Charles, he saw that this was the only means of bringing order and peace in England. His rough, harsh nature, like his stern, harsh face, did not inspire affection, though, under his rough harsh nature like his stern harsh face did not inspire affection, though, under the rough outward appearance, there was kindness, but his strength his unshakable honesty and his sincere religion made him respected as one of the greatest Englishem. Verb study. 9. Bring. On pages 104, 107, and 109, you have the sentences. He was brought up, equals educated, trained, to believe in the divine right of kings. It was the hour that brought the man. He was brought to trial in London. The essential meaning of bring is to carry to the place where the speaker is, e.g. Bring me your book. Jack will bring along some color photographs, page 23. But there are numerous variations from this meaning. Here are some. What brings you equals, why have you come here today? That remark brought his guilt home to him, equals, made him realize it. His work has brought him fame and riches. What brought about, equals caused, the failure of the business? The sight of that Heather brings back, equals reminds, calls to mind, the happy days we spent in Scotland. The jury brought in, equals gave, a verdict of not guilty. His illness was brought on, equals caused, by poor feeding. The publishers are going to bring out, equals publish, a new edition of that book. Exercises. 1. Word study, use the following. Thread, pattern, history, what is the difference between history and story, struggle, supreme, use also supremacy. Reduce, what is the opposite, decisive, use also decide, decision, indecisive, portrait, what is the difference between a portrait and a picture, vivid, handsome, what is the difference between handsome, pretty and beautiful. Admire, use also admire, admiration, trust, noun and verb, use also trustworthy, untrustworthy, untrust, vote, false, use also falsely, falseness, falsehood, arrest, oppose, use also opposition, opposite, resist, use also resistance, yield. Majority, what is the opposite, weapon, learning, noun, extreme, use also extreme, extremely, certainty, stained glass, philosopher, use also philosophy, courtier, use also courtesy, what is meant by the king's court. Palace, compare with place, humble, adjective and verb, use also humbly, humbleness, gratitude, the corresponding adjective is grateful, use also ungrateful, gratefully, ingratitude, calm, note the silent L, forbid, county, compare country, obedience, use also obey, disobey, disobedience, scatter, imprisoned, use also prison, prisoner, imprisonment, sentence, verb, mercy, use also merciful, merciless, blot, noun and verb, what is blotting paper, enforce, tyrant, use also tyranny, tyrannical, Harsh, use also harshly, harshness, affection, use also affectionate, affectionately. 2. Explain the following words or phrases from this lesson. 1. The king was all-powerful. 2. It is parliament that, in all but name, is the chief power. 3. One of the most decisive moments. 4. It was the hour that brought the man. 5. The king gave any promise, that no promise he gave, was of any value. 6. They faced very heavy casualties. 7. Their caps decorated. With the soaring of outwards. 8. They wore gaudy ribbons in their mitres. 9. In gaily colored clothes. 10. Their faces were habitually sour. Comprehension exercise. 3. Give short answers to the following questions. 1. In this long struggle, one of the most decisive moments, came in the 17th century. What struggle is referred to? Why was this a decisive time? 2. Why did the parliamentarians decide to resist Charles I by force? 3. Why did the parliamentarians suffer defeat at first? 4. If you had been living in the 17th century, how would you have been able to tell a cavalier from a Puritan? 
5. How did Cromwell bring about military success for the parliamentarians? 6. How does Cromwell's order, trust in God and keep your powder dry, combine, the spiritual and the practical? 7. What were the main things that Cromwell did for England? 4. Express in other words, 1. He nothing common did or mean upon that memorable scene, but bowed his comely head, down as upon a bed. 2. On the rich and the learned, on nobles and priests, they looked down with scorn, for they knew themselves to be rich in a more precious treasure, nobles by a greater right, priests by the laying on of a mightier hand. 5. Learn by heart the lines of Marvell, page 109, the words of Cromwell, page 110, and, if you feel like it, the passage from Macaulay, page 107. 6. Use in sentences of your own the following idioms with bring, bring up, bring about, bring on, bring out, bring the house down, bring to a close, bring, something, off. 7. Composition exercises 1. Write character sketches of 1. A Puritan 2. A Cavalier 2. Give your impressions of the character of 1. Charles 1. 2. Cromwell 3. Write an essay on one of the following 1. The Divine Right of Kings 2. The Hour Brings the Man 3. A Few Honest Men Are Better Than Numbers 4. Trust in God and keep your powder dry. 5. In things of the mind we look for no compulsion but that of light and reason. Thank you for joining us on Essential English. We hope you enjoyed today's lesson. Remember, learning English can be fun and exciting, just like our little friend here. Don't miss out on more engaging English lessons by subscribing to our channel and hitting the bell icon. Stay connected with us and join us next time on Essential English. Together, let's unlock the world of language.